Welcome to iLecture Online. And the next topic we're going to talk about here, in order for us to understand better how bonding works between atoms to form molecules, is something called electronegativity. So what is the definition of that? What does that really mean, electronegativity? You might have heard it a lot as you try to study um, chemistry. But what it really means, it's the ability for an atom to gain an electron. So it's kind of like with how much force, with how much tenacity does an atom try to gain another electron. But we need to do that here in the, in the uh, space of it being part of a molecule. For example, how hard does a, a hydrogen molecule or a hydrogen atom pull on an electron when it's bonding with other atoms? How hard does a fluorine atom pull on an electron when it's bonding with other atoms? That is the concept of electronegativity. The greater the pull, the higher the electronegativity. The weaker the pull, the lower the electronegativity. So how do we figure that out? Well, that was always a big problem because it is easy to figure out the strength of a bond or the strength of a pull to an electron uh, when, uh, when it's by itself. When a hydrogen atom or a fluorine atom is by itself, we can easily do a chemistry test to figure out what, the, what we call electron affinity is. So the electron affinity is the pull to an electron when it's a single atom, and that's easy to figure out. But when it's part of a molecule, it's hard to figure out because we have to be able to attribute the pull to one, to one atom versus another atom within a molecule, and that's not, e not easy to do. So a number of people have come up with various ways in which to calculate the electronegativity, and none is a perfect method. Most of them are very good methods. And so what we've come to now is a table, like a periodic table, where over the years we've been able to attribute an electronegativity to each of the atoms by doing various tests and various calculations. So one of the calculations that was done was done by Pauli. He's one of the first ones that came up with the concept of electronegativity and how to actually calculate that. And so they use this symbol for electronegativity. And the way they do that is compare one atom to another. And the way that's calculated then is the difference between electronegativity between two elements, A and B. A and B could be any two atoms. Well, that's equal to 1 over the square root of EV. Now, EV is the unit for electron volt, which is the energy by which an electron is pulled towards an atom. So this is just added to the equation in order to get rid of the unit because we will come up with the square root of, of EV in units in the numerator and want to get rid of it by also putting in the denominator. So this is basically a unitless number electronegativity. So we take the, dissoci the what we call the dissociation energy of each of the two atoms when it's bonded to another atom of its same kind. For example, what is the dissociation uh, energy? How much work does it take to pull two fluorine atoms apart from one another? How much work does it take to pull two hydrogen atoms apart from one another? And then finally, how much work does it take to pull a hydrogen away from a fluorine atom? And by doing that, we can actually calculate a number that is a reasonable representation of the electronegativity between the difference between the electronegativity of hydrogen and the electronegativity of fluorine. Of course, when you do that, when the calculation only gives you the difference between two, you need to have some base number. And so what they decided to do is put the base number on hydrogen, so they called the base electronegativity of hydrogen 2.2. Now, in some textbooks, you'll still see this as 2.1 because 2.1 was the initial value, and then later on, they changed that to 2.2. Now, notice this is not an exact science because none of the numbers that we get are actually the exact numbers that are in the periodic table. Of course, they did some smoothing functions and some smoothing curves and so forth to kind of come up with the numbers the way they are. But anyway, just to give you an example, the dissociation energy to, for two fluorine atoms is 150.6 kilojoules per mole, which comes out to 1.56 electron volts per molecule. The same for hydrogen. The energy required to pull two hydrogens apart is 436.4 kilojoules per mole. That comes out to 4.52 electron volts per molecule. And then for a hydrogen fluoride molecule, it takes 568.2 kilojoules per per mole to pull those apart, which equates to 5.89 electron volts. So what Pauli did is after you did these kind of experiments, he then put those into this equation. And so let's figure out what we would get if we do this equation. So the difference between the um, electronegativity, for example, for fluorine minus the electronegativity for hydrogen is equal to, we'll just leave the units off, the square root of the dissociation energy for the two molecule for the molecule which is this right here which is 
5.89, and we'll just leave out the electron volts, minus the average value of the other two. The average value if you had just fluorine, and the average value if you just hydrogen. So that would be the average value of um, 1.56 plus 4.52, and we, of course we have to divide that by 2. And let's, let's see what value we actually get by doing this calculation, and let's then compare that to what the actual number is. So let's see here, we take a 1.56 plus 4.52 divided by 2, subtract that from 5.89, and then take the square root of that, and we get 1.69, well, we'll just put it down, so that's equal to 1.69. So that is the calculated difference of the electronegativity between hydrogen and fluorine. Now, hydrogen is based to be 2.2, fluorine is 4.0, so you can see that the difference is actually 1.8. Our calculated value is about, hmm, we can say, this is about 1.7. So pretty close, but not exact, because again, as we noticed that over the many calculations that we did, and we had a smoothing function came in, then we, we estimated that the actual value between the two is probably closer to 1.8 than 1.7, so fluorine has an actual electronegativity that's 1.8 bigger than hydrogen, and therefore we call that now 4.0 instead of 3.9. Although some books yeah, actually have it as 3.98 or 3.95 and so forth, so it's not an exact number. Anyway, just to give you now a feel of what the electronegativities are on the periodic table, notice that the ones up here, the ones that have a very high electroaffinity, also have a very high electronegativity. So these atoms right here, when they bond with other atoms, have a very strong pull towards electrons. Now on the other end of the periodic table, down and to the left here, you see that the electronegativity is a very small number, so those atoms have very weak pull towards uh, electrons. Notice that it goes up as we go up on the periodic table. Notice that it goes up when we go to the right of the periodic table. So we can see that the electronegativity increases as you go from left to right. And also notice that the electronegativity increases as we go from bottom to top. So that also increases this way. You can see that there's some local differences due to the formation of the electrons in the various orbitals. Notice that here we have, uh, let's see here, 1.7, 1.6, 1.5, and 2.0. So you see that it's not always the case, but this is, these are the elements, of course, or yeah, the elements that have one electron in the p orbital, the first p orbital of that particular group. Also notice some interesting differences here that we have also a, a decrease when we get to manganese, a decrease when we get to molybdenum and technetium, because this is where the d orbital gets completely filled by stealing one electron out of the corresponding s orbital. And then you can see that happens again when you get to zinc and cadmium, because now the d orbitals have a complete set of 10 electrons, and you can see that the electronegativity takes a little dip when we get there because we have a more stable structure there, so less tendency to try and pull in electrons, so you see there's some local differences. But in general, the rule is true that when you go to the right, it increases, when you go up, it increases. Why is electronegativity so important in the bonding of atoms when we form molecules? It's because the way the atoms are positioned in a molecule depends a lot on the electronegativity. Atoms which have a lower electronegativity tend to take the central position in, um, in a molecule. Electrons that have a higher negativity tends to take positions that are more to the outside of the molecule. It's just an interesting uh, result of that, but at least understanding now the electronegativity and notice how one compares to another, you can expect which molecules will be more in the central position, which molecules will be more to the outside of the molecule. Did I say molecule? I meant atom. So again, which atom is more to the center of the molecule and which atom is more to the outside of the atom. So it is, it is important in learning how to figure out how things are bonded together by understanding the concept of electronegativity and how it plays a role in the bonding of, of molecules. Anyway, that hopefully that gives you a pretty good picture of what electronegativity is and why it's important. There you go.